Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Mac Barrett, Curator of Public Programming at Roosevelt House. It's my job tonight, uh, my privilege, to uh, welcome you all here and to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, uh, and it's always a special privilege, um, a special pleasure to welcome a Roosevelt to Roosevelt House. And um, so with special pleasure, I'm happy to welcome Mr. Kermit Roosevelt III. He is, um, I'll go through the biographical details very quickly. He is the great-great-grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, a first cousin of some number of remove from Eleanor and a distant cousin of, F of FDRs. Um, he's also a legal scholar and teaches constitutional law at University of P uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and his, he's the author of books including the Myth of Judicial Activism, to Novels, Allegiance, and In the Shadow of the Law, and of course, the book that has brought us all here tonight, uh, The Nation That Never Was, Reconstructing America's Story. It's a provocative and important book for our times, even as, it page t even as its pages take us back to our country's beginning. It's a book that challenges the common concept and narrative of, Amer of America's founding, uh, encouraging us to reevaluate the roots of our most fundamental values and suggesting uh, strongly that we should consider ourselves not the heirs of the founders, as we might ordinarily do, but the heirs of, instead of Reconstruction and its vision for equality for all. Uh, as Publishers, Publishers Weekly said, the nation that never was is a work of astute textual analysis, careful historical research, and a deep commitment to social justice, which make this an inspiring re-examination of America's past. So without any further ado, and with much, much appreciation, please join me in welcoming Kermit Roosevelt III. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to talk for maybe 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Um, and then I'll go, I'll be signing books upstairs, and we can continue the conversation there. Um, in this talk, I'm going to try to quickly summarize the argument of the whole book, which means I will be moving pretty quickly. Um, but during the Q&A period, you can ask me about particular points that you think are interesting or that you can't believe are true or whatever strikes your fancy. So generally speaking, I started writing this book because I thought what I was saying was true, but I also ended up thinking that it could be useful in a particular kind of way because I think that America is facing a particular kind of problem. And the way that I would describe that is to say our national story isn't working anymore. What is a national story? It's a version of our history that tells us who we are and what we should do and what we should be willing to fight for. It tells us who the heroes and the villains of our history are, who we should identify with, who we should emulate, and who we should disapprove of. And it's supposed to inspire. It's supposed to call us together to make sacrifices in the name of shared ideals and our American identity. We had a story that did this, what I call in the book the standard story. And part of what I'm going to say is it never worked as well as its supporters believe for a couple of different reasons. But today I think it's quite clear it's just not working because people today and particularly younger people are rejecting it. They think it's not accurate and they think that if you do make it accurate, it's no longer inspiring. And then it can't fulfill its job because a national story is supposed to inspire. So let me tell you now, in very skeletal form, the standard story. The key idea, really, is that our fundamental American values, liberty and equality, are there from the beginning. They're the heart of founding America, the seed from which America grows. And they're stated in the Declaration of Independence, most notably in the phrase, all men are created equal. And then we fight for them in the revolution, and we make them into law with the Constitution written in 1787. And then American history is the story of more fully realizing those ideals in a more or less steady progress. And the heroes of this story are the people who champion those ideals. So people like Martin Luther King in 1963 in the March on Washington, or Abraham Lincoln in 1863 in the Gettysburg Address, or of course the original Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, 1776. And the standard story wants you to think of those three moments as fundamentally similar. Americans are coming together 
in the name of the Declaration of Independence to fight for equality. And it wants you to think that we are the same America with the same values at each of those moments. Same values, the same constitution, the same nation. Now, I don't know how convincing that sounds to you. Different audiences react in different ways. And I went backwards in time there from 1963 to 1863 to 1776, in part to make it sound a little bit more plausible because I didn't want the transition to be too jarring. I didn't want to say the people who champion liberty and equality like Thomas Jefferson in 1776. And the degree to which I find that jarring has something to do with having thought sort of obsessively about this for the past 10 years. And not everyone feels this way, but as I look back on the history, I think Thomas Jefferson was kind of a creep. <laughs> he enslaved his own children. And it's very hard for me to hold him up as an embodiment of American values if I want people to believe that American values are good. And my sense is that increasingly people today, and particularly younger people, but not only them, um, agree with that. Urban educated people also tend to agree with that. So we've got an urban educated group here, even if it's not a particularly young group. Um, so that's the problem that we're facing now. It's, it's sort of a dilemma, right? We want to be truthful. And a lot of what I'm talking about here is teaching school children at the high school level or even younger, right? We want to be truthful, but we also want to be positive and patriotic, right? We don't want to teach children that America is a bad country, but as the standard story gets more accurate, it does get less inspiring. So what's the solution? Well, you could try to prop up the standard story and defend it from alternative views. You could require public school teachers to teach this story. There's a Florida law that says public school teachers shall teach that American history is the development of a nation based on the universal principles of the Declaration of Independence, which I think bans my book, banned in Florida. Um, or you can forbid teachers from making it more accurate. You can try to wall out alternative viewpoints. You can ban the 1619 Project, for instance, which many bills do. So this is what's happening now around the country. These are the anti-critical race theory laws that you have probably heard of. But ultimately, I think this is not going to work. It's not going to work because the alternative viewpoints have too many facts on their side, and they're too well established. And we had a cultural and ideological battle over whether it was permissible to question the goodness of founding America. But that battle is pretty much over, and I think it's now established you can, and people are doing that. And you can't use law to reverse what's really a cultural ideological defeat unless we become a substantially more authoritarian country, um, which is possible, but that's a different talk. So I'm not a supporter of these attempts to use law to defend the standard story. And one thing that I do in the book is actually to try to expose the weaknesses of the standard story. Now, a lot of people have been doing this recently, so uh, I'm not claiming to be especially original here, although I think I will say something about the Declaration of Independence that maybe you haven't heard before. Um, it's surprising, but it's actually, I believe, pretty clearly the original understanding, the understanding of 1776. So criticism of the standard story, that's been done before. I do it in a slightly novel way, but that's mostly the negative project of the book. And the positive thing that I do, which I think has not been done before, is to offer a different story, a story that is both more accurate and more inspiring, one that shows us in America that we can believe in. It's a story that's more useful in that sense, and it's more inclusive, or rather it includes the right people and excludes the people that it should exclude. So in some ways, what I'm saying here is not radical at all, really. It's patriotic. It's trying to affirm America. Now, by the way, I think the 1619 Project is patriotic too. Um, and in terms of the ways that I want to change the standard story, I am more radical than 1619, because 1619 still keeps the basic format, the Declaration of Independence stated our ideals, we've fought to realize them over time. And those are the keys to the standard story, as I see it. Our ideals are there at the beginning, we're the same America we've always been. And I reject both of those points. So now let me tell you quickly how I reject them. And to situate what I'm saying in terms of conventional historical scholarship, I would say 80% of what's in the book, and 80% of what I'm gonna tell you now is accepted 
by the leading mainstream historians. The other 20% is kind of radical, and it sounds novel, but it's actually not new facts, and it's not even really new interpretations of facts. It's things that I think follow pretty clearly from the accepted 80%, but that we have just not been willing to accept. So here's the first example. The Declaration of Independence, as it was understood in 1776, does not contain our modern ideals of liberty and equality. Why do we think it does? Well, we understand all men are created equal to mean something about how the government should treat people, treat them equally, or treat them with equal concern and respect, recognize that they're all equally worthy, something like that. This is what Martin Luther King says in 1963. It's what Lincoln says in 1863, but it's not what Jefferson says in 1776. In 1776, the phrase is understood very differently. It's understood as conventional enlightenment social contract theory. What it means is in the state of nature, which is a hypothetical world with no government and no laws, no one has an obligation to obey anyone else. So if people just somehow popped into existence, if they were created, as the declaration says, in that world, there would be no legitimate political authority. What does this mean for the Declaration in the context of 1776? It's a rejection of the divine right of kings. And that's really all it is. It doesn't mean that once governments are formed, they should treat all people equally. It doesn't mean that for the insiders, the people whose consent forms the government. And it doesn't mean that for outsiders who aren't part of the political community. So the statement, all men are created equal, is actually perfectly consistent with enslaving outsiders. There is no contradiction there. And people in 1776 understood this, which is why the preamble of the Declaration was not considered very important at the time. And as I said, 80% of this is standard mainstream history. The historians who have studied the Declaration and the context agree that all men are created equal is an invocation of Locke and social contract theory and a rejection of the divine right of kings. They also just sort of assume that somehow in addition, it's this statement of broad moral principles that we take it to be nowadays, that it means the government should treat people equally and slavery is wrong, even though it would have made no sense for Jefferson to say that. It would have undermined his argument by making the colonists out to be wrongdoers. And the Continental Congress took out a passage in Jefferson's early draft of the Declaration that seemed to criticize slavery. So there's a lot of evidence against this additional meaning that we've fastened onto it. Um, and yet, right, it's what we say. So in 1776, the Declaration didn't have those ideals. Moving on to the Revolution, it would then be very surprising if the Revolution was a war for those ideals. And in fact, it wasn't. So the ideology of the Revolution is complicated. Different people had different understandings. But a useful way to think about it maybe is to look at the relationship between the Revolution and slavery, because slavery is clearly contrary to these ideals. So the standard story wants to tell us, ideologically, the revolution is a war against slavery. Gordon Wood, in an interview, said, slavery existed everywhere without substantial criticism until the American Revolution made it a problem for the world. But if you go back to the perspective of 1776, this is a very strange thing to say. So in the revolution, neither side is fighting to end slavery. Neither side is abolitionist. But the British are undoing it where it's convenient for them, and they're arming the formerly enslaved, and they're dressing them in uniforms with sashes that say liberty to slaves. And the Americans are saying basically, this is the worst imaginable thing you could do, freeing the people we enslave. There's a British member of parliament named David Hartley who actually proposes to Benjamin Franklin that the British will restore the pre-1763 status quo. They will repeal all of the acts passed after the French and Indian War that the colonists hated so much. If the colonists agree to one thing, which is giving enslaved people a right to trial by jury as a first step towards abolition. And Benjamin Franklin, who's one of the best founders, I think, right, way better than Thomas Jefferson, writes back to say, by inciting slave rebellions, you have proved yourselves unworthy to rule us. Basically, there is no going back from that. And what's the ultimate effect of the revolution? It puts American slavery beyond the reach of the only national government that had the power to end it against the will of the slave states. So as I said, different people understood the ideology 
differently. And some people did think that what they were fighting for in the revolution was inconsistent with slavery. But the key question here, as far as I'm concerned, is are those people the founding fathers, right? Are they at the heart of founding America or are they actually out at the periphery? Are they more the dissenters? And you can get a sense of where the anti-slavery interpretation falls by looking at the moments in which the 13 states come together to speak with one voice. So that's the Declaration of Independence, for instance, where the colonists complain bitterly about the British emancipations of the people that they're enslaving. And then also after the revolution, the Treaty of Paris, where the colonists demand that the British depart North America without carrying away, as they put it, any Negroes or other property of the inhabitants. And the British defy that treaty obligation to their credit. American diplomats pursue this for decades, demanding, in terms of outrage, compensation for the people that the British freed. So the revolution, I think, is a little hard to spin as a glorious war for liberty or a war against slavery. What about the 1787 Constitution? This actually has basically nothing at all to say about the liberty or equality of individuals. So the 1787 Constitution contains absolutely zero provisions that protect individuals' natural rights from other individuals, which is what the governments described in the Declaration of Independence are supposed to be doing. And the federal government created by the Constitution is not in the business of protecting individuals' natural rights either. Congress couldn't then, and Congress in fact can't now, pass a law that prohibits one American from killing another. So the most basic protection of your natural rights, protection of your life, is actually beyond the power of the federal government, except in special circumstances that make it a matter of federal concern. So why is that? It's because the 1787 Constitution is almost exclusively geostrategic, you could say, in its orientation. That's a term I got from Akhil Amar. Um, it's creating a federal government that can make the states pull their weight and that can handle issues that can't be left to the states. But for most individual to individual interactions, whether one person is violating another person's natural rights is just not an issue of federal concern. It is all left up to the states. Except for one particular context where the 1787 Constitution does pay attention to violations of natural rights. It notices, you could say, that some people are violating other people's right to liberty. Some people are enslaving other people. And it notices this not because it's interested in protecting individuals' natural rights, but because slavery is a source of interstate friction. So the geostrategic constitution is trying to manage that, and it manages it in the way it usually does through compromise. But these compromises tilt in a pro-slavery direction. So the 1787 Constitution protects the international slave trade until 1808. It abridges state sovereignty to require states to return fugitives. And it gives slave states extra voice in every branch of the federal government. It gives them extra representatives directly through the Three-Fifths Compromise, and then extra electors, because states' electors are determined by adding their representatives to their senators, and then through the influence over the president, extra influence over the composition of the judiciary. And one more thing, the 1787 Constitution contains a rule that Congress can't ban slavery in the territories and that black people can never be US citizens. Now your reaction to that is maybe, wait, that's not the Constitution, that's what the Supreme Court said in Dred Scott, and it is. Um, and then you might say, and everyone knows Dred Scott is wrong. But I have two responses to that. The first is, suppose that we're just being formalists trying to figure out what the 1787 Constitution means. I think Dred Scott is pretty clearly wrong that Congress can't ban slavery in the territories. I think that's the kind of resolution of interstate friction that you would expect the geostrategic Constitution to allow the federal government to enact. But I am less sure that it's wrong in saying that black people can't become US citizens. Maybe that's a bad reading of the 1787 Constitution, or maybe the reading is good and it's the Constitution that's bad, because the 1787 Constitution clearly has some bad pro-slavery provisions, like the Fugitive Slave Clause, takes away states' rights in order to protect slavery. But the second and maybe more important point is that saying that Dred Scott is wrong doesn't rescue the 1787 Constitution. 
and rescuing the 1787 Constitution is what I think people are trying to do when they say Dred Scott is wrong, right? Dred Scott seems like an evil decision. If the 1787 Constitution produced it, then it is also a flawed and perhaps evil document, and that reflects badly on us because we're the same nation we've always been, and that's our founding charter. So the reason that doesn't work, even if you say Dred Scott is wrong, is that Dred Scott is a 7-2 decision. Seven justices vote in favor. And you can say, oh, but those seven were biased pro-slavery judges, and maybe they were, but then you have to explain how we got seven biased pro-slavery judges on the Supreme Court, and the answer is pro-slavery presidents, who we got in part because of the three-fifths compromise. So the bottom line there is, Dred Scott is not so much the product of bad apple individual racists as it is the product of systemic racism. And the system there is the 1787 Constitution. So where does that lead us, right? Can you say Dred Scott is actually right? Or at least Dred Scott is a predictable consequence of the system and not be saying something bad about modern America? Well, you can't if you're trying to tell a story of continuity of the progressive realization of founding values, a story where we're the same nation that we always are. You can't if you want to tell the standard story. But maybe you want to tell a different story, a story of rupture, where founding America wasn't that great, and it was defeated and overthrown. And we are the heirs not of the founders, but of the people who destroyed their America. Well, that's what I want to do. So that's what I call the better story. And what is that about? It's about American ideals as the product, basically, of dissent. People look at founding America, and they realize it is an unjust society, and they set out to change it. And in my story, these people are primarily abolitionists. So historically, it's abolitionists who pick up the phrase, all men are created equal, and start reading it differently, not for equality in the state of nature, which is what I call Jefferson's equality, but for equality in society, under law which I call Lincoln's equality. So abolitionists put this new reading on the Declaration. Why? Basically because they have nothing else, right? The 1787 Constitution, as I said, is kind of pro-slavery. William Lloyd Garrison, famous abolitionist, publicly burns a copy, calling it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And there's no other federal document that really even gestures at equality. When Congress in 1790 is deciding who's eligible for US citizenship, they say free white people. So if you want to fight slavery, the Declaration is probably your best bet. It's got these suggestive phrases. And this new reading prevails. The Republican Party wins the presidency in 1860, and the South secedes. So now we have a war, which is a crisis. And of course, it's also a great opportunity for change. But it's important to understand that initially, Lincoln doesn't want that. Lincoln wants to restore the status quo. And the theme of all of his speeches is union. But then around 1863, something changes. He stops talking so much about union. He starts talking about the nation. The United States becomes a singular phrase instead of a plural one. In the 1787 Constitution, it's plural. And Lincoln says, slavery will end. That's the Emancipation Proclamation. There will be a new birth of freedom. That's the Gettysburg Address. So what's happening here? Well, the best way to think about this, I have come to believe, is by distinguishing between two different types of revolutions. One type is what I call a regime change revolution, where the idea is the existing regime is unjust and it must be destroyed. And that, for example, would be the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. And the other type is what you could call a status quo revolution, where the idea is the existing regime is fine, but we are, be we are being denied the rights that we are due under it. And that's the first American Revolution, where the colonists' complaints are basically they're being denied their rights as Englishmen. And it's also the second American Revolution, which is the Civil War, because the Confederates don't repudiate the US Constitution. The Confederate Constitution they draft is very similar to the 1787 Constitution. They just say the free states and the national government are distorting our Constitution and denying us the rights that we were guaranteed when we joined up. And then what happens in 1863 is that the Civil War shifts from a status quo revolution to a regime change revolution. And it does this not on the part of the Confederacy, because they're still fighting for what they always were, but on the part of the United States. The United States is what I call Lincoln's side. 
for reasons I'm happy to explain later. The existing regime is unjust. It must be destroyed. That is the message of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address. And we look back now, right, and here we're in the 80% where everyone agrees. We say yes, right, in 1863, you see this turning point. The goal is no longer restoration of the Union. It's the end of slavery. And of course, Lincoln wants to destroy the Confederate regime because it's unjust. But here's the 20%. That's not the regime he's destroying. So remember, the 1787 Constitution singles out slavery for special protection. It says or it implies, if you believe seven justices, Congress can't ban slavery. Black people can never become US citizens. If you ban slavery with the 13th Amendment, if you grant birthright citizenship with the 14th Amendment, you are destroying that political regime, right? You're destroying founding America. Well, not really, the standard story says, because we're doing it through the amendment process set out in Article 5, and what we're really doing is putting the values of the Declaration into the Constitution. That's what the 14th Amendment does. So this is the standard story. Reconstruction is really continuity, and it's the vindication of the promise of 1776. But that, frankly, now strikes me as crazy, because think a little bit more about what happens with the Civil War and Reconstruction, and ask yourself, what side is founding America on? Think about these foundational documents, maybe the Declaration, the 1787 Constitution. So start with the Declaration. It's pretty clear to me. The Declaration of Independence supports the Confederates. They are, after all, declaring their independence. And they are doing so because they think a different form of government will better affect their happiness, which is when the Declaration says you can do it. Um, and they're not wrong. I mean, they're wrong because they're evil and moral people. But they built their society around slavery. And they joined a union with a governing charter that protected that institution. And now the national government has fallen into the hands of people who want to destroy it. So the Declaration says governments get their just authority from the consent of the governed. The Confederates want to withdraw their consent and start over, perfectly consistent with the Declaration. And Lincoln, who in the Gettysburg Address says he's fighting in the name of the Declaration of Independence, is saying, no, I reject your independence. I will use military force to make you stay in the Union. And after that, I'm going to remake your society against your will without your consent. I mean, that's really not close. Now, the 1787 Constitution, I think it is closer. Um, but the general point is the founders thought the national government was dangerous. They thought it might become a threat to the rights of citizens. And if that happened, the states would stand up to defend their citizens. The Revolutionary War, right, the militias fighting off the Redcoats, is the model that is built into the 1787 Constitution. And again, that is the Civil War. You can read Federalist 46 to confirm this. James Madison, a slave owner from Virginia, is reassuring readers, go ahead, vote for this Constitution, ratify this Constitution, because the states will always be more powerful than the federal government, and they will defeat it in war if necessary. What would happen, he asks, if the federal government starts interfering with how states want to run things? Well, if it came to force, it would be like the revolution, 13 states against the national government, he says. And of course, the states would win. Think about the patriots, right? Marching under their Betsy Ross flag, 13 stars in a circle. Now in 1776, I think I haven't mentioned yet, every state recognizes slavery. So every one of those stars represents a slave state. And of course, this is exactly what happens, right? 13 states fight the federal government. They raise a flag with 13 stars in a circle, each star representing a slave state, because that's the first flag of the Confederacy. But they lose. And what I'm telling you is founding America loses there too. It loses in terms of the substance of the Declaration, because rather than the ability to separate and consent of the governed, you get forced union and forced inclusion against the will of the Confederates. It loses in terms of the 1787 Constitution, its substance, and not just with slavery, because the Reconstruction Amendments turn the Founders' Constitution inside out. Now the federal government is the good guys, and the states are the bad guys. Now the federal government is protecting individuals. The first constitutional provision that places a limit on what one individual can do to another is the 13th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment rejects the laws of slavery as if they were no more valid 
than the laws of the Confederacy. So this is uncompensated emancipation. Doesn't seem radical now, right, because it's so obviously the right thing to do, but it's radical at the time, and it suggests that the laws of slavery were never valid, that they are part of a political order that is being overthrown and rejected. So if you're a slaveholding society and you want to reform and be the same society you've always been but abolish slavery, you do it gradually and you pay compensation, which is what happened in the North before the Civil War. But the 14th Amendment says something different. There will be no payment of rebel debt, it says. All claims based on rebel debt are illegal and void. And in the very same sentence, it says no claims based on emancipation. All those claims are illegal and void. Now again, maybe this doesn't seem radical, right? You might say, of course, we're rejecting claims based on Confederate debt and Confederate laws of slavery. But the crucial point is, again, those aren't just Confederate laws. Every state had them in 1776. They existed before secession. And they existed after secession in states that stayed in the Union and fought on Lincoln's side. And then they were all wiped away because the existing regime was unjust and had to be destroyed. And that regime was not the Confederacy. It was founding America. And then the second point, which I think is even stronger, is that founding America loses in the process of Reconstruction. And this is something I think we teach incredibly poorly in our schools. How did Reconstruction happen? Well, the former Confederate states accept that slavery is over in name, and they ratify the 13th Amendment, even though maybe they don't really want to. But they're not willing to accept black citizenship. This is actually the reason that John Wilkes Booth explicitly gives for why he kills Abraham Lincoln, black citizenship. And the former Confederate states reject the 14th Amendment. Congress sends it out. State legislatures reject it. By 1867, it's clear the 14th Amendment will not be ratified. You will not get three quarters of states ratifying it. So then what happens? Congress wipes out the former Confederate states. It spares Tennessee, but 10 of them, it says no governments exist there. Military, the military is the only authority. Now the federal government really is actually protecting individuals' natural rights. And then the next thing Congress does is it makes new states. So they've got the same names, they've got the same geography, but there's a different political community because Congress says the formerly enslaved are citizens. So it's not people coming together and deciding to form a government, it's Congress saying who comes together. And these states have a different political structure because Congress says write new constitutions and the formerly enslaved can be delegates to those constitutional conventions and can vote for delegates, and the former Confederates can't. So of course, you get very different constitutional conventions. You get majority black constitutional conventions in South Carolina and Louisiana, and you get very different constitutions, and you get very different legislatures that go on to consider the 14th Amendment. So the legislatures that ratified the 13th Amendment in 1865 look a lot like the legislatures that voted for secession in 1861, right? Those are the same states. Black people are not citizens. The legislatures are white and they're democratic. The legislatures that ratify the 14th Amendment in 1868 are racially integrated and they're Republican. So those are the states that ratify the 14th Amendment. They are not the states that seceded. They look totally different. So there are three different versions out there, I think, of the ratification of the 14th Amendment. One, which is probably the conventional wisdom, is, oh, there's nothing to see here. It's the ordinary Article V process. But no one who knows the history thinks that that's true. The people who do know the history tend to say Congress coerced the former Confederate states into ratifying. And what I'm saying is that's also not the right way to think about it, I don't think. I mean, the legislatures that ratified the 13th Amendment, they were coerced, right? They're not really anti-slavery, probably but they understand we lost the war, we have no choice. And it's the same people who seceded, recognizably, who are doing that. The legislatures that ratified the 14th Amendment are not being coerced. They are happy to ratify it because they are racially integrated Republican pro-equality legislatures. They are the legislatures of new states. New states, new nation, new federal constitution. Founding America is destroyed, I'm telling you. If there's anything that would have upset the founders, it's Congress annihilating the states, right? Dissolving our legislatures, 
is actually one of the complaints in the Declaration against King George. And King George never went nearly as far as the reconstruction of the Congress. Right? This is not consent of the governed. This is not a people defining itself. This is a political community and political structure imposed from above. So the short takeaway, what I'm trying to tell you here is American history is not best understood as a story of continuity. It's more a story of failure and reinvention. And the 1787 Constitution has not served us well for over 200 years. It lasted about 80 years and it failed. And we are not the heirs of founding America. We are the heirs of the people who destroyed it. So why is this a better story? Well, one, I think it's just more accurate, right? I can tell this and I'm not glossing over horrible stuff that undermines the values I'm trying to promote. Um, although there's something to be said about reconstruction and the exclusion of women. But on the whole, right, I'm actually, I actually have an answer for that. So I'm not glossing over stuff that undermines the message I'm trying to impart. Um, and I think it's more inspiring because no matter how you tell it, the standard story does have some horrible stuff, right? No one can deny slavery was legal in every state in 1776. And one of the things that means is the heroes of the better story are better people, I think, than the standard story. So Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton, they're not as good as Thaddeus Stevens, Charles Sumner, Hiram Revels, Robert Smalls, Harriet Tubman. Um, and here's maybe a more concrete example of that. If the patriots of 1776 are our heroes, what are we being told to do? What do they do? Well, they focus pretty obsessively on injustices they think have been inflicted on them while ignoring the rather substantial injustices that they are inflicting on others, right? The whole crescendo of the Declaration of Independence is basically King George is trying to make us into slaves, which is in fact an illegitimate thing for a government to do to its own citizens. Um, but this overlooks the fact that the patriots are literally enslaving a million people in colonial America. Um, and that's not inconsistent with the theory of the Declaration, I said, because these people are outsiders, but it sure does make the Patriots look a little less sympathetic. Now compare that to the U.S. Army of 1863 or 1865, when it's more racially integrated. That's an army that's fighting to bring freedom to others. It's people making sacrifices in the name of justice. And the message there is look for injustice in the world, even if it's not your fault, and try to make the world a better place. And then there's a particular way that this echoes into the present day. So the standard story tells us that white paramilitaries fighting the national government are good guys, even if what they're doing is maybe technically insurrection or treason, because those are the sons of liberty and the Minutemen, and they're fighting the oppressors. And the story that I want to tell tells us actually the opposite thing, right? The white paramilitaries fighting the national government are bad guys. They're the white lead the Red Shirts, the Ku Klux Klan, and they're fighting the liberating national government. So there's a pretty stark choice, like which of those is better for our current situation? Well, I mean, what this makes me think of, obviously, is we've got white paramilitaries fighting the national government now. They are the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters. They were there on January 6th flying their Revolutionary War flags and saying we're doing the right thing even if it is technically insurrection or treason because we're fighting the oppressors. Um, and they're not wrong to draw a connection to founding America, I think. And they're also not wrong when they blend in Confederate emblems because the Confederacy and founding America have a lot in common. But we're wrong if we tell a story where those are the good guys, right? We want a story that says those are the bad guys. And then the last point I said before, the story I want to tell is more inclusive, or rather it excludes the right people. So one of the problems with the national story is it's not going to work for everyone. Some people will have difficulty seeing themselves in the moment that you're holding out as the birth of the nation. So some people have difficulty seeing themselves in reconstruction. And that, I think, is a large part of why we tell the standard story. We've sort of agreed we're going to take the values of Reconstruction, but pretend they come from the founding because people aren't that comfortable with Reconstruction, some people. Well, OK, right? No story is perfectly inclusive. And there are also people who have trouble seeing themselves in the founding. And 
the people who have trouble seeing themselves in the founding are the people who think that writing the phrase all men are created equal doesn't make up for enslaving your children. The people who have trouble seeing themselves in Reconstruction are the people who identify with the Confederates, who are traitors who killed hundreds of thousands of Americans in a war to preserve a society built on slavery. So if we have to marginalize one of those groups, if we're gonna make them feel uncomfortable and wonder whether our America really shares their values, I think that's an easy choice, right? We should marginalize the traitors. So depending on the time, I can give you one last point, which is about how this is not quite as radical as you might think. Um, the standard story has structural features that we like. There's a short document that states our ideals. There's a war that's fought for them. There's a longer document that makes them into law. And the story I've told you has all those things, right? The short document is the Gettysburg Address instead of the Declaration of Independence. The war is the Civil War instead of the Revolution. And the Constitution is the Reconstruction Constitution instead of the 1787 Constitution. It's all there. All we have to do, it's not a big thing, is move it 80 years forward. And then we get a much better story. Thank you. All right, so now um, I'm happy to take some questions for a bit, and then we'll go up and do some book signing if anyone wants. Yeah. My name is Victor Hauser. Uh, do you think there's a danger when we talk about the good guys and the bad guys and the founders might uh, be unenlightened, that mores change over time. I imagine that uh, some of that your great-great-grandfather might not think that uh, the 1619 Project, that America was founded on the basis of slavery. I'm gonna guess 100 years from now, they're gonna think a lot of our attitudes are quite strange. So uh, uh, d don't mores change over time and so to say who's good and who's bad, isn't that somewhat unfair? Well, so I think it's unfair. So yes, mores do change over time. And how do we judge people in the past? Well, I sometimes feel, and I do actually say a couple times in the book, if you're trying to say this is where our American values are born and they're the same values, then you actually should be using the standards of now. Um, in order to judge people in the past fairly, I think if you apply modern standards, most people don't look very good. And what you should do is really judge them relative to their time and ask, did they move society forward or did they move society back and what were their contributions? And it's a complicated process. But what I'm trying to say is in any national story, there will be heroes and there will be villains. There will be people who are the good guys fighting for the values that we hold dear now and then the people who are the antagonists. And the question is, how do your choices of casting for your heroes and villains echo into the present day? Because you want your national story to be useful and teach the right lessons. And I'm not saying the founders are villains necessarily. They're not villains in my story. They're just sort of part of a different country, really. The Confederates are villains though. And if you tell a story where the founders are your heroes and the white paramilitary is engaging in insurrection against the national government are heroes, then it becomes a lot harder to say, oh, and the Confederates are villains, right? The white paramilitary is engaging in insurrection against the national government. 80 years later, suddenly they're bad guys. Why are they bad guys? They're doing the same thing. So what I wanna say is we get a better sort of moral purchase on the present day if we let go of the founding as the source of our heroes and our ideals and look at Reconstruction, which actually does a much better job of giving them to us. just like to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, everything's not so black and white. Yes, s slavery was terribly bad, 100%. We could agree on that. But everything else, Thomas Jefferson, for instance, he was, he was the brilliant linguist. He was the one who wrote the Constitution. He was the only one that could write all these concepts. Now, the, the founding fathers, um, they took out that whole uh, paragraph about slavery only because... South Carolina and North Carolina would not agree to sign the Constitution if they had that paragraph in there. Benjamin Franklin stepped up to the plate and said, are you gonna give up this whole chance of us having freedom uh, because of one paragraph? So uh, John Adams was desperate to have the slavery um, 
issue, paragraph in there. You couldn't do it. But what they accomplished was a lot. And it wasn't, I don't think, the Constitution wasn't about slavery. It was about the tax and, and being released from England, right? And um, so Thomas Jefferson, you know, according to me, if any, any man that I would know would have his children slaves walking around serving dinner, I mean, I cannot think very highly of him, but no person is 100% one way or the other. So we, maybe we just have to lift our perspective a little bit and realize that we shouldn't, everyone is half good and half bad, I mean, really. So it's not black and white. And it's interesting how the one decision about the Constitution, how it's reverberated every decade in a different way, and all these decisions just keep reverberating. Anyway, I enjoyed your talk. It was interesting. Thanks, I don't yeah. agree with it all, but of, of course not. I'm trying to be provocative, but um, I agree with you that it's not all black and white, and people are complicated, and people have good traits and bad traits. Um, the question I think is really, if we want to tell a story that promotes the values we say we believe in, like equality. What is an effective way to tell that story that doesn't require us to significantly misrepresent historical fact? And what I have come to believe is it is historically more accurate and also more effective to tell a story that centers Reconstruction, which is not saying, like as I said before, I'm not saying the founders are the bad guys. I'm saying it's difficult to tell a story about universal equality that makes them the heroes and the sources of our ideals because honestly that's not what all men are created equal meant in 1776 when Thomas Jefferson wrote it. It's what abolitionists said it meant later. So if we want to put that ideal in its proper context and really be able to tell a story about how it grows in American hearts and acquires power and how eventually we sacrifice an enormous number of lives to make it a reality, right? Which is an inspiring story. That story has to be about the Civil War and not the Revolution. But again, this is not to say the founders are the bad guys. The founders are just part of a somewhat more distant past than we think. And we're not connected to them in the way that we think. Um. Usually I'm the first one to raise my hand, but this time I want to listen to everyone uh, because I'm an immigrant, anyhow. Uh, I think there is an aspect of Native Americans, uh, the suprem supremacy clause of the Constitution gives the treaties the highest standard. Uh, I don't know if you, you were theory encompasses uh, also towards the Native Americans. And the secondly, coming from outside, from India, and looking at it inside, now we have the British rule. I chose to come to this country because you thought I must be British. But anyhow, that's the second point. The point is, uh, as I lived here for so long, besides the legalities, I see there is a uh, kind of Elizabethan philosophy throughout this country, underlying current. Uh, th that's basically, and there is a privilege, like in the Roman Empire, there is a white privilege in this country. Every time that is threatened, uh, uh, there has been an uproar despite the civil war, people going back and forth. Uh, it is that element, I think, uh, uh, made Trump and also uh, other uh, conservative elements in Europe, like in uh, Nazi elements in even in uh, Europe. They're all rising up in this, at this point. I'm sorry, I'm giving a lecture instead of asking a question. Uh, so what do you think of uh, this uh, element of uh, uh, white privilege and when it is threatened how they are flocking towards uh, uh, all the theories using all the intellectuals to the uh, backward thinking of uh, only the Confederacy and all that. Thanks. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so very, very good questions, just, just quickly. With respect to Native Americans, um, it's hard to tell a story about the United States treatment of Native Americans that is accurate and inspiring. I mean, I think our treatment of Native Americans was shameful. And really all we can say about that is this is an instance where we didn't live up to our ideals or our legal obligations. And we have to figure out what we can do about that now, right? We have to figure out what the best path forward is. So it doesn't really feature that much in either of these stories. I mean, one of the things that the standard story sort of glosses over is the Declaration of Independence does talk about Native Americans and it calls them merciless savages who are out to kill the colonists. And it's true, actually, there was tension between Native Americans and colonists. But again, that's because of oppression that the colonists are engaged in. Right? I mean, they're not treating the Native Americans very well. So that's one thing. Um, on the issue of like white privilege and the rise of fascism, in the book, I try to distinguish between two ideologies, one which I call exclusive individualism and one which I call inclusive equality. And the basic point there is you can have a society that focuses very much on insiders and says outsiders are different and dangerous. And that's basically a fascist theme. Um, and you kind of see that in the Declaration because the Declaration is all about people come together to protect their own rights and then there are these outsiders and in the Declaration you've got three groups of outsiders, all of whom are going to kill the colonists if they don't band together to fight them off because it's the Hessian mercenaries that King George is transporting across the sea to complete his works of death and destruction. It's the enslaved people who are rising up in rebellion as King George is inciting them. Um, and it's the Native Americans who also King George is inspiring to kill the colonists. So there's this very much us versus them, strong insider outsider line in the declaration and it persists through founding America. And the Supreme Court says there's a racial line around the American political community in Dred Scott. And if you want an example of inclusion, so a political regime that says to the exclusive states, these people will be citizens no matter what you want. That's the 14th Amendment and Reconstruction, right? And that again is why I like Reconstruction better. Um, sure, yeah, like, well, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you for your talk. Um, and your book, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about reparations and um, in the way, in your framing. So I've, I've thought about it at, for whatever my thinking is worth um, as the, the creation of the Constitution literally threw African Americans under the bus, or I guess under the cart, it might be a better analogy, uh, over and over and over again. And so how, how, what would, do you think, w based on your research and your thinking, would, could reparations look like, could repair look like? And I know that those are two different things. Um, yeah, thanks, that's a great question. So, I don't usually use the word reparations. I think I do in the book. Um, but I tend, I tend not to use the word reparations because it gets people upset. And I think it gets people upset because it suggests that one person is being asked to pay for wrongs done to another person and then the person who's being asked to pay is like, I didn't do it, it's not my fault, what are you accusing me of? And they get defensive. Um, so what I prefer to talk about is like targeted investment. So the government directs money in lots of different directions and we subsidize all sorts of different things and the federal government has over the, the course of the 20th century distributed billions of dollars to build the American middle class and do various other things and promote home ownership and the GI Bill and education. We've got all of these great programs. Um, but sometimes explicitly and sometimes just in the way that they're administered, but pretty much always by design, they exclude black people. So there's a massive transfer of wealth, but it's really going to white people. 
And what seems very reasonable to me would be to say, we've, you know, we've been race conscious in the distribution of government benefits for a long time. And it would be sort of only fair if we started doing some things that are race conscious in a way that will reduce inequality rather than increase it. And there are lots of things you could do that and you don't have to single out people and you don't have to draw connections to past oppression and you don't have to blame anyone in the same way that we have disaster relief for victims of hurricanes and we don't blame anyone for causing the hurricane. We can just say, gosh, there's a lot of racial inequality in society and the average white household wealth is like 20 times the average black household wealth. And maybe it would be worth doing something about that. And I think there are lots of reasons why it would help if we could reduce racial inequality. And let's look at some programs that you know, can be administered in a race neutral way and don't have racial classifications in them, but you know, we'll target particular neighborhoods or we'll target particular programs. And we're gonna have a redistributive effect that actually reduces racial inequality. I think that would be easy to do. And I think it would make things a lot better. Okay, should I, I should go now? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I do have to get a train back, so I want to have some time for the, the book selling. Um, but thank you so much.